over to the cloud. So, you know, just with like everything else we've been talking about in this course, you know, we talk about terminology, notation, things like that. Uh, here we're gonna get into some vocabulary and the symbols associated with them. Um, so parallel lines, there are two lines. I mean, it, it, we're familiar with the concept of what parallel looks like. You know, it, you see it every day when you drive on a road, you know, double yellow line in the middle of the road, those are parallel. Okay? But uh, in terms of just a more intuitive understanding, you know, we, we think of it as two lines that never intersect with one another, but we also have methods by which we can prove that two lines are parallel to one another. Okay? It, it's one thing for them to look like they're parallel. It's another thing for them to actually be parallel. Right? And so that, that's where things kind of get tricky. Right? Let me get rid of this it's in the way a little bit. But I can show you a quick example. You know, we're, we're not really doing much or anything with equations in this course, but if I give you a line, for example, and then I plot another line that is parallel to that, and I tell you it's parallel, you'd, you'd be pretty confident, you know, that I'm not, that I'm not lying to you, you know, I suppose that that's a possibility, but, you know, those look like they're parallel to one another, but you're really just taking my word for it. All right now, if I do this, those two lines still look parallel to one another. If I didn't show you those equations, you know that you would not have any means by which you could verify that they're parallel or not parallel. All right, except to determine whether or not they ever intersect with one another. All right, but based off of the screen that you see, and you know in front of it, it, there's no way to tell unless you're able to manipulate that screen. Now I can manipulate it, but that doesn't mean you can, All right? So now if I go out further, 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 still looks parallel, but if you look closer and care, uh, more carefully, you know, I'm gonna say carefuler, you'll see that those two lines are getting closer and closer to one another just at a very, very slow rate. So if I go far enough, they'll actually intersect. So I can, I can kind of cheat here. Just zoom out a lot and then zoom back in. Yeah. That, they're definitely closer to one another than they were previously. You know, if I go back to the original zoom, right, if I look at this with red on, red on top, blue on the bottom, right? Now let me zoom out like a bazillion times. So originally, I've already forgotten. I think I said red on the top, blue on the bottom. So now let me go out really, 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 really far, and then bring it back in. Now I have blue on the top, red on the bottom. All right, that means they must have crossed somewhere. Otherwise, it would still be red on the top, blue on the bottom. All right, so those two lines crossed one another. It's just from this window, you can't really make that determination. All right, I could do a, a less extreme example. You know, these these actually look like they're getting closer together, but but it's a little bit more obvious that they are getting closer together as we go further down the line. They do intersect. All right, so what we would need to do is come up with a method that would allow us, based off based off of any snapshot of two lines make a determination of whether they're parallel or not because right? otherwise they could be lines that intersect right? they could be skew lines skew lines really only occur in three dimensions so let me show you I, I, we're not going to do too much with three dimensions just yet uh, 
my wife was using my computer. I, I, I personally am not a Justin Timberlake fan. Um, I have no explanation for that, except to say, please believe me. Now, I, I suppose there's another, if you're a Justin Timberlake fan, then you're like, what's the big deal? Why, why is this such a problem? Um, I'm not a fan. What on earth is he talking about? Oh, search history, folks. That's the thing. All right, let me uh, show, get rid of this. So this is a three-dimensional graph. All right. So uh, GeoGebra is really cool when it comes to that. You can do three-dimensional renderings. It, it's just not, um, it, uh, uh, let me just put it this way. It's a little glitchier than, than Desmos, but it's the best free software out there. And software is a, you know, not really the right term, but you know what I mean. Right, so if I type in, and, and again, there's no, no basis for you to know where these equations are coming from. It's really just the visuals that, that we care about. So like if I give you a plane, right, this is a plane. It's basically two dimensions that extend infinitely, right? So a line extends in two directions all right, so where it came from and where it's going along that line infinitely, but a plane does that with a second dimension. So it has a length, but it also has a width, All right? So if I'm looking at an X and Y axis, uh, let me see if I can remember, I think the red is X and the green is Y, but it really doesn't matter. Yeah, that's correct, All right? This looks like a line, right? Because we're getting a, a profile view of that plane. We're kind of looking down its edge, right? So if I get another plane in there, something like uh, x equals negative one, now I have two parallel planes. From this perspective, they look like two parallel lines. But from this perspective, they're two parallel planes. All right, so I just kind of, I, I, in the past anyway, when I would teach this class in person, I, I would just do a very simple demonstration for a plane. And that is take a piece of paper and imagine that it extended forever in every direction. Mm -hmm. that, that would be an example of a plane, All right? Um, for anybody who's a sports fan, if you like football, they talk about breaking the plane. You know, like they, you score a touchdown, and like you go over the, the goal line. It's, you don't actually have to physically make contact with the line on the ground. That line extends upward infinitely. So if the person who's running into the end zone can jump 700 feet in the air, they would still score a touchdown. There's no limit to how high you can go, right? There's just boundaries on the width, but in terms of the height, you can go as high as you want, right? That's the plane. Uh, the goalposts, right? If you're kicking a field goal, the goalposts, though, in that interior, so you have your two posts, it's in the shape of a U, right? All that area in there, that constitutes a plane that extends upward forever, even though the posts don't extend upward forever. So if you kick it right down the middle and it goes 700 feet in the air, it's still a field goal, right? But there are exceptions to that. You know, like when you, when you get into um, like basketball, for example, you know, there's restrictions. Like there is a plane, the rim, that circular rim has a field that, con that contains a, a, a very, a restricted plane. The ball goes through that plane, it's a basket, it doesn't, it's not, right? The front of a, a goal in hockey or soccer, right? All you have to do is cross that plane and, and it's a goal, right? That's the same idea with this. So if once you penetrate this barrier, you're in the goal area, right? But what we're focused on here is the relationship between two planes, right? 
So these two are parallel to one another. And then you could say something like, um, I'll do y equals x plus one. These would not be parallel, right? Because they intersect, these are intersecting planes, right? But their profiles are intersecting lines, right? That's an important thing to realize because what happens is, you know, it's very easy to lose sight of where all of this stuff kind of fits in the broader universe. You know, you learn about geometry and in, in most cases we focus on only two dimensional geometry, you know, rectangles and triangles and things like that. But all of these things form the basis of three dimensional figures. And so if you understand how things work in two dimensions, then you can understand how they work in three dimensions. Okay, you just extend it outward because this is a triangular region. I could even really make it triangular if I throw in a, let's say y equals negative one. And again, the equations don't matter. It's just what the shapes look like. I have three intersecting planes. From a certain perspective, it looks like three intersecting lines. That creates a triangular region, right? But if you really look at it carefully, you see that that's a triangular volume, right? Because it's got height along with it. That creates a triangular prism, right? Anytime you project a two-dimensional figure out into three dimensions, you know, basically giving a two-dimensional figure some height, you're looking at a prism. You know, so it and that gets you into the third dimension and that creates a volume. Right. So that's what all this stuff is talking about in terms of terminology. You know, it's a, probably a longer explanation than was necessary, but you know, it's it's definitely worth the time because the visuals I think uh, kind of make all the difference. Right? But then once we re realize that we're talking about instances in two dimensions that allow us to learn about three dimensions, and that that kind of gives us a, a goal for everything. You know, so we talk about things like exterior angles, interior angles, consecutive, you know, all the things on this list. And so I have uh, a little diagram here. Right? Um, the, these are just ways of noting what the name of the line is. So I'm calling this line L and line K. So it really doesn't matter what you call them, as long as you call them something, right? So these are my two lines. When I say exterior angles, I'm talking about angles that are outside of the two lines all right, in this context. So anything outside of the two lines would be considered an exterior angle. So that's outside, that's outside. All right, those would be exterior angles. All right. The two lines would be the ones that are either going to intersect or not intersect. Now, a transversal is a third line that intersects the other two lines, all right? So, and it could be more than two lines, but we'll only focus on the two lines, all right? So that line T, that's the transversal, all right? So this is the transversal. Now, the interior angles, would be everything that's contained within the line, right? So that would be these angles. All right, so the exterior angles are angles one, two, seven, and eight. The interior angles are three, four, five, and six. Consecutive interior angles. That's kind of that's kind of a weird term. Just because we know consecutive to mean one after another, you know, just from like everyday life. If you've taken an algebra class, you probably remember those consecutive integer problems. You know, with the let statements and all that fun stuff. All right, just rocking a couple of cough drops here. So. That's not what this means. 
you see the definition there, angles in between the two lines, but on the same side of the transversal. So if you know what a transversal is, then it's easy to identify what the consecutive interior angles are, because if you know what the interior angles are and consecutive, then you're good to go, All right? So here we're looking, let me get a different color, fresh new color here, I'll go yellow for this new score home. So an example of consecutive interior would be three and five. Another example would be four and six. Right. So three and five are consecutive interior angles with one another. Right. So angle three and angle five. All right. Also angle four and angle six. Yeah. Alternate exterior angles. So that that works. You know, so alternate interior, alternate exterior angles, uh, they're, they're kind of, it, it's sort of weird in the sense that in some ways it's kind of common sense and in other ways it's like, uh, I'm not really quite following. So they're outside of the two, so alternate exterior. So they're outside of the two lines, the two non-transversal lines, but on opposite sides of the transversal. Right, so that's easy enough, but it's easy to kind of lose sight of that. Let me just kind of bring it in here. You have, let's say, for example, I'm looking at number uh, angle one here. I'm on one side, so I'm, I'm on the exterior, right? So I'm outside of these two lines, this one and this one. So I'm on the exterior. But now I want to be on the exterior of the other line while also being on the opposite side of the transversal. Like I said, it's like it's easy enough conceptually, but sometimes practically speaking, it's not the easiest thing in the world. So here's my transversal. Oh, for the love of Christmas. All right, hold on. Let me. See if I can get it this way. I might do it. And not quite. And it's good enough. So this is my transversal. And let me make that red. All right. So I need to be outside of the two other lines while also being on opposite sides of the transversal. All right. So here's one side of the transversal, here's the other. So outside would put me in this space. Other side of the transversal would be any of these. So where they overlap would be this space over here. All right. So it's kind of like where are the two ideas happening in conjunction with one another? So little logic reference there. So opposite side of the transversal could be any of these angles, but also on the outside, the exterior of the other line, that must mean it's angle eight. All right. And one of the important properties and one of the reasons why we need to know this is because those two angles, if line L and line K are congruent to one another, those two angles, would, I'm sorry, line L and line K are parallel to one another, then those two angles would be congruent to one another, all right? So, but that's not the case here because L and K are not parallel, but we have two lines cut by a transversal, one pair of alternate exterior angles would be angle one and angle eight. There's always two pairs, all right? So the other pair would be two and seven. All right, so I'll just go back to highlighting here. In fact, let me do something real quick.
paste. Just put that there for a sec. Get rid of that stuff. Bring this highlighting back. I make things so complicated sometimes. Sorry about that. But yeah, so these would be my alternate, a pair of alternate exterior angles. Just rid of that flop there. All right, so we'd be looking at. this angle and this angle, also this angle and this angle. All right, so these are alternate exteriors. Can't write. All right, now because I did a, a screenshot of it, I'm stuck with this, I can't edit it at least in terms of those two arcs that I drew there, those are just a reference angles one and eight. Normally when you put the same number of arcs, that means that they're congruent in, in size. These are not necessarily congruent because these two lines are not necessarily parallel to one another. They don't look like they're parallel, so we can assume that they're not, right? So at least in this case. So one and eight, two and seven are uh, alternate exterior angles. Right? So angles one and eight, angles two and seven. So let me uh, show you the alternate interior angles. I just got to clean up the diagram because that was a flamingo who took the screen grab without really thinking it through. This I think I can do. Yeah, looks terrible, but it could be worse. Now I'm gonna take a screenshot of that, copy it, get rid of this. Oh, Lord have mercy. A little bit better. I'll clean this up a little bit later, but alternate interior angles. Those would be line, um, angles that are in between the two lines, but on opposite sides of the transversal, right? So in this case, I'll use the same highlight color scheme. That would be three, I'm sorry, uh, four, five, three, six. All right, so they're both pairs of angles, both pairs of angles are contained between the two lines that may or may not be parallel, but they're on opposite sides of the transverse. So angle three and angle six, angle four and angle five. The corresponding angles, that's a little bit easier to understand okay, in terms of, um, <clears throat> There's positioning within the figure. Just because by definition occupies similar positions in relation to transversal and lines. So if I'm looking at each cluster of angles, we have some angles that are, you know, acute, some are obtuse, and you know, every every which way, but the idea is that they're going to occupy a similar position within each cluster, right? So one and five, even though they're not the same size, they occupy the same position as in they're both on the upper left-hand side of that cluster. Two and six, both on the upper right-hand side of that cluster. Three and seven, four and eight, right? So Corresponding angles are usually the easiest things to identify because they correspond to one another. Right? So it's it's kind of a systematic thing. You know, if I say, if you're kind of walking around the building 
or a building, a classroom building, whatever. And I tell you to identify the first person in the room. So a student who's sitting closest to the door in each room. Those are corresponding positions from one room to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. All right. So that's really that's really all there is to it. So just I you know, listing it all is kind of a pain. You know, one in five. Two and six. Three and seven. Four and eight. All right. The one that's the biggest pain is the vertical angles, not in terms of conceptual understanding, but in terms of displaying all the possible pairs of vertical angles. Each of the pairs of opposite angles made by two intersecting lines. All right. So, very simple example of right below. Just looking at this here, two, uh, two and four, angle two and angle four here, those are vertical angles. Why they're called vertical, I have no idea. I did at one point, I took the time to look it up and understand it, but I, I it's trivial information, so I, it's, it has not stood the test of time, but, they're in a cluster of angles created by two intersecting lines. They're the opposite pair, all right? So there's two possibilities here, two and one, I'm sorry, two and four, one and three. Vertical angles are always congruent. All right. So in our original diagram, there's eight possible pairings. You could have one and four. Two and three. Oh, I'm sorry, four possible pairings. Eight, eight angles that are relevant. Uh, angle two and angle three. My ampersand game is off here. Uh, five and eight. Six and seven. Right. So that's really a nice. Um, I mean, it's it's hideous to have to write it all out, but it's a nice relationship because it's something that you can always rely on. So when you look at, and, and this is kind of a streamlined version of it. The, the example of files given the figure identify sets as alternate interior, alternate exterior, corresponding, et cetera. I'm going to pull this out for a sec. It's not that bad if you know if you know the definitions, but I guess that's you can say that for a lot of things. So four and five. Now these are two lines. I have two lines here, one right here. Uh, that's terrible. Well, that's line A and line B, all right? Angle four and angle five looks like, or they look like they are on the interior. They're between angles A and angle B, uh, angles A. Jeez, I can't, I can't talk tonight for some reason. Lines A and B, all right? So they're on the interior because they're between A and B. Now it's just a question of whether they're consecutive interior or alternate interior. Well, this is a line here that cuts through other lines. That's, that's the definition of a transversal or one of the definitions of a transversal. I can't get it to lock in. All right, so this is our transversal. So 
these two angles are on the same side of the transversal, but between two other lines. That makes them consecutive interior. Seven and nine. All right, they're, they're on opposite sides of the transversal, but in between two lines. All right, the two lines that they're in between are B and C, but they're on opposite sides of the transversal. So they're gonna be alternate interior. Five and 12, all right, so we get a little double dip here, but five and 12, well, five is on the interior between lines A and B, but 12 has really nothing to do with line B or A, all right? So the, the two relevant lines here would be lines B and C. So the way that angles uh, five and 12 relate to B and C are that they're both on the exterior, right? They're outside of those two lines. Now those two lines happen to be parallel, says it up here. So that's gonna factor into any conclusions that you'd be able to draw in terms of the value of angle five and angle 12, but they're on opposite sides of the transversal outside of the two lines. And right, so those are alternate exterior angles. And then we have two and four. Those are those are the nice ones. Here's two. Here's four. Oh, that looks awful. Not much better. But two and four are opposite angles in the same cluster created by two intersecting lines. Those are vertical angles. So we have consecutive interior angles, alternate interior angles, alternate exterior angles, uh, and vertical angles. Little typo here. Supplementary shouldn't have been there. We'll get to that later. Right. There are um, relationships that we're going to discuss. Discuss being the word of the day. Discuss, as in having a conversation. Discuss. D I S C U S S. So angles and parallel lines. Hey, objectives. I don't, I don't know why I wrote this. I'll take it as a typo also. No new vocabulary. Why? It was like back when I was a rookie and I had to make like formal lesson plans that would put stuff like this in there. And some of it stayed. Okay. So, you have parallel lines and transversals. Now we had lines and transversals. Now they're, we're stipulating that they are parallel lines. The two lines are parallel to one another, right? So what I'm saying here is that K is parallel to L. I can't make a lowercase script K like very easily. I have like, it's just not going to look good. So I'm just going to get a little key here. That's not going to look much better. I was like, when I was growing up, I was right on the edge of when they stopped caring about like script educationally.
And it really, really came back to haunt me when I started teaching geometry. Yeah, so K is parallel to L. In this case, N, that I can handle, is parallel to N. Okay, and these are the relationships that exist because of that. All right, so, and they're pretty wordy. You have two parallel lines, and you'll notice that they're all conditional sentences. And right, if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then each pair of corresponding angles are congruent. All right, so we talk about corresponding angles as being same position within the different clusters. So what that's telling me now is that if I look at my two clusters, I don't want to do it like that. I have my two clusters here. The upper left hand angle is going to be congruent to the upper right hand angle. So angle one is going to be congruent to angle five. The upper right hand angle in the first cluster will be congruent to the upper right hand angle in the second cluster. So angle two will be congruent to angle six. The lower left hand angle in each cluster will be congruent. So angle three will be congruent to angle seven, and the lower right-hand angles in each cluster will be congruent, so angle four and angle eight will be congruent. My angles are starting to look more and more like less than symbols, just their angles. I don't intend on using a less than symbol at all in this lesson, so when in doubt, it's an angle symbol. Yeah. If two parallel lines are cut, cut by a transversal and each pair of alternate interior angles are congruent, right? So those are the ones that are in between the two lines, but on opposite sides of the transversal. So that means angle three and angle six will be congruent. And it means angle four and angle five will be congruent. Now, if I tell you, and I'll, I'll, I'll make it even simpler here. If I tell you that if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then the angles that look like they're the same size are the same size, that might help. Now, that's what I've done in the past, where it's like, we've got all these rules. But if I tell you that two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then the result of that would be any angle that looks like it's the same size as any other angle would actually be the same size as that other angle, All right? So whether it's called an interior angle or an exterior angle, that, that makes it matter a little bit less, All right? At least until we get to proofs, All right? So alternate exterior angles, we got outside the lines, but on the opposite sides of the transversal, those will be congruent also. So angle one would be congruent, poor quality congruent, to angle eight. Angle two would be congruent to angle seven. If two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then each pair of consecutive angles, consecutive interior angles, would be supplementary, right? Supplementary angles add to 180 degrees. So supplements add to 180 degrees. So that's telling me that angle three and angle five, those measures measure of angle three and the measure of angle five would add to equal 180 degrees. The same would hold true with four and six. Now we don't really talk about 
well, we don't talk about them at all, consecutive exterior angles, because it's how are they consecutive if they're not adjacent to one another in any way. But there are other angles that would add to 180 degrees. So the relationship there is any, if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, so we know the two lines are parallel, any angle that looks the same is the same. Any angles that look different will add to 180 degrees. Right? So that's kind of like the more uh, lay person way of saying it. Right? If a line is perpendicular to one of two parallel lines and it's perpendicular to the other, that one's a little simpler because here's your diagram. And basically just illustrating that in, in, in action. So that's telling us that based off of this display here, we're saying that M is perpendicular to L and M, I'm sorry, N is perpendicular to L also. That's oh, all right, I gotta zoom in. Right, so if it's perpendicular to one, it's got to be perpendicular to the other. And that allows you to do some, uh, some number crunching here because in the example below, you see X and Y are parallel to one another. They're saying, we know that the angle at 11 is 51 degrees. You just got to figure out everything else. Well, not really. We just got to figure out what they're asking us to figure out, but we can figure out everything else. So angle 10 right here, well, that, that doesn't look like angle 11, right? The angle at 16 does look like the angle at 11. They're both acute. If you've slapped a protractor on both of these, you get something that's roughly the same. All right? It would be up to human error to, to kind of get it to be more precise. But we can say that the angle at 16 would be 51 degrees. The angle at 10 would have to be supplementary. Because like I'm saying, if they look the same, they are the same. If they don't look the same, they're supplementary. So I would do 180 minus 51, that's gonna be 129 degrees. So any angle that looks like angle 10 would also be 129 degrees. Any angle that looks like 11 would also be 51 degrees. So all of these angles, 51 degrees. All of these angles, 129, 129 degrees. I might accidentally said 121 degrees, but 129 degrees. All right, so uh, with that in mind, like the number crunching shouldn't be bad. When we get to the proofs, it'll be a little bit more challenging, but the, the crunching of the numbers shouldn't be the hard part. Uh, Number two is a little, little dice here though. It's kind of a busy looking diagram. I didn't make this one myself, which I kind of regret because all these, all these dots kind of make it confusing. So let me just take a second here and revitalize this a little bit. I'm just going to grab this and just bring it on over here. I'm going to call this point up here R, this one T, and this one V. Now, all that other stuff, I, I used to have like 10 other questions for this diagram. That it's not really necessary. So this is also 65 degrees here. Right, so 
we need to figure out the measure of angle RTV. Oops. Now, at first glance, it doesn't seem like there's a ton of information to work off of, but there's actually plenty. All right. So it's just we have to kind of get a little cute with this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a third line. All right. Let me move this T out of the way for a sec here. I'm going to introduce a third line that's also parallel to the first two. So all three lines are parallel. All right, so then I can look at this, just this part here, I'm gonna reduce this a little bit in size. As its own two parallel lines cut by a transversal kind of situation. And you might say, well, I'm not seeing a transversal. And it doesn't go through the two lines, but we can extend this line starting at R we can extend this as far as we want along that path. So now I have two parallel lines cut by a transversal. If I know that the alternate interior angles are congruent, then I would now know that this angle here, let me make this a little thicker this time, a little thicker than that, should be good. This one would be 60 degrees also, because these two angles here form alternate interior pairs, right? Because they're contained within the two lines, one, two, but they're on opposite sides of the transversal transversal. So I now know that that's 60 degrees. So I'm deducing. All right. Now, if I pretend that this wasn't here, and you know, so I, I don't like the busy graph, so I want to I want to keep things as simple as possible. I'll put that back in in a minute. But let me get it out of there for a sec. And extend this line starting at V through that point at T, or what would be T, get a fresh new color here. I'm gonna go with that color. Then we have another two parallel lines cut by a transversal situation. Here, here, here. All right, so now it's alternate interior angles again. So this 65 degree angle here would also exist over here and make this 65, oh, poor quality 65. So yeah, it's a pretty intense looking diagram but there's no reason why we can't extend line segments because line segments are just parts of individual lines. So you can, you can extend the pathway. It's like if you drive down the road and then you stop, that's great. You travel the line segment. But who's to say that the road doesn't continue or that you can't continue? Right. So what we needed to find here was angle RTV, which is going from R to T to V. So that's this angle here that now contains the 60 and the 65. So the measure of angle RTV would be 60 plus 65 degrees, which would be 125 degrees.
So we can work the other way. Uh, we have some new vocabulary here. Uh, equidistant um, has the same distance. I'm smushing together of equal and distance or distant, equidistant. And, um, in fact, I mean, it's not really much of a story, but I remember when I first heard this word, equidistant, the way my teacher pronounced it, it would really enunciate the, the we, equi, it's the equidistant. And I just thought, you just said it funny. Like I was like, man, he really says equally distant pretty funny. You know, it's like I said, not much of a story, but it's, you know, it's just one of those things where it's like, that can't possibly be a word. Well, actually it is. It's equidistant, but, you know, people tend to like really enunciate it and say equidistant, you know? So I think that sounds weird. So I just try to minimize the, the what is that, the third syllable? Equidistant, right? same distance. Right. Uh, locus is that a set of all possible points to satisfy a given condition. In parentheses, you can see there, parallel lines can be described as the locus of points in a plane equidistant from a given line. Right. Um, there we go. So those terms are going to come up over and over again. So I figured I'd put them down there somewhere. Right. But, we're, uh, we, we talked about if two parallel lines were cut by a transversal, then what would happen? We'd have corresponding angles congruent, alternate interior angles congruent, alternate exterior angles congruent, and then we'd have uh, consecutive angles being supplementary. But we need to know, well, one of the things we need to know is how we can prove that two lines are parallel to one another. What we can actually do is use some of these relationships to help us draw that conclusion. So that's where the first four um, statements here come from. But it's basically saying, if you, if you have two lines that are cut by a transversal, not necessarily parallel, at least at first, but if you have two lines that are cut by a transversal and you know that the corresponding angles are congruent, then those lines must be parallel. Right. So it's actually the converse of the, the statements on the previous page. I think it was the previous page. So, you know, the converse statements are not always necessarily true, where you take the premise and the conclusion and swap them. You know, if I am wearing a red shirt, then I am wearing blue shorts. It doesn't necessarily mean that if I am wearing blue shorts, that I, that, then I'm wearing a red shirt. But in this case, it actually plays out. If two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then the corresponding ang angles are congruent. If the corresponding angles are congruent, then the, the two lines are parallel to one another. If the alternate interior angles are congruent, then the lines are parallel. If the alternate exterior angles are congruent, then the lines are parallel. If the consecutive angles are supplementary, then the lines are parallel. Right. So all of those are converse statements of the previous, oh, all the conditional sentences on the previous page, right? Which is one of the reasons why we talk about logic in this course, right? That's the connection. It allows us to draw conclusions based off of the piece of information, right? Which I, that's gen generally what propositional logic talks about. But if I tell you certain characteristics of geometric figures, and then I tell you on top of that, that those conditions have been met. You know, there's characteristics, there's conditions necessary for a geometric figure to be, let's say, a square. And then I tell you that those conditions have been met, then the figure must be a square. Right? That would be modus ponens. Right? It's uh, affirmed by affirming. Right? If you have a quadrilateral, with four congruent sides and four congruent angles. We'll get, we'll get to quadrilaterals in the next lesson, but well, just go with it at this point. 
if those conditions are met, then the figure is a square. Then I tell you in the next sentence, those conditions are met, then it must be a square, All right? So it's really just kind of contextualize all the stuff that we did in the logic component of, of the course, which, which makes it trickier because now you have to throw in uh, content knowledge associated with uh, geometry terminology. Right? So now you're getting into like what makes a quadrilateral a square, what makes a triangle, a triangle equiangular, you know, or equilateral. You know, these are some things that we'll have to learn about. All right. Uh, the next one, if a given line and a point, if, sorry, given a line and a point in space, then there exists exactly one line through the point that is parallel to the given line. All right, so that, that's this idea here. Oh, my pen stopped working for a hot second there. All right, so I have a, a point and a line in space, All right? So this, when I say in space, I really mean in space. Because we live, when, when we talk about geometry, like as in this course, we live generally in two dimensions, but that doesn't mean that you can't have a line that's just kind of floating out in space, okay? So here's a line, oh, line segment. And here's a point, you know, my fingertip is a point. Those are two points in space, just because they're not on paper, that doesn't mean that, you know, it's not a line and a point. You know, it, it could have, it could be suspended midair, who knows, right? I can show you a quick case in uh, GeoGebra. Again, just that you don't really have, don't pay any attention to the commands because it's, it's not gonna mean anything. It's really just to give you the demonstration. This one's going to be fun. Keep hitting the wrong keys here. Story of my life. All right, so there's a line. Looks like an ordinary line. Let me just extend, expand words, expand my screen. Close that. Now it's gonna glitch on me nicely here. That's what I was saying before about GeoGebra being kind of an issue when it comes to that. Uh. Mm -hmm. There's like a five here. Yeah, it glitched on me pretty good. Okay, so that came back. It's just not letting me rotate it, so I can't do what I wanted to do with it. It's annoying. Let me try hitting settings here. Show plane. Don't show plane. Just ah, that was a waste of time. Annoying. You know what I can do? Let me just pause the recording real quick. I'll show you on the. So, in two dimensions, it's pretty easy because this line here can only be parallel if the distance from any point on this line is the same 
no matter where it is on that line, the same distance from the other line, right? So if I want a parallel line to go through point P, all I'd have to do is ensure that the distance from any point on this line, no matter where I go, to the other line would be equivalent. So th this distance here has to be the same as this distance here, has to be the same as this distance here. And, you know, everywhere. So this, 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 anywhere else I could draw a line, those distances have to be the same. All right, no exceptions. The good thing is if, if you have two lines and the distance from any two corresponding points on those lines are equivalent, then those lines would be parallel. The trick is to make sure that those two lines correspond to or those two points correspond to one another. And the way that would occur is if they form right angles. So these angles would have to be perpendicular, 90 degrees in every case. If that's the case, and these two line segments are equivalent in length, then the two lines would be parallel. You'd only need to show that in two instances, right? But there are other ways that we can do this. We can, we can actually construct parallel lines based off of just knowledge of um, geometry tools. Oh, the phone rings sometimes, I don't know why. Hold on a sec. Oh boy. Oh, somebody got a good one. I mean, somebody answered it and hung up immediately. Um, so if you know how to use a compass, you know, the, the circle drawing compass, then you're, you're able to construct line segments that are um, equivalent in, in distance from one another. And so um, the, the way it actually works is pretty, it, it's pretty nifty, but it's also, you know, a little on the on the strange side, so we'll we'll get we'll get to all that stuff too as we go forward. Except I'm going to do it in a slightly different way because I have a circle draw tool, uh, so I don't need a compass. But I'll, I'll show you how to do it using the appropriate techniques, right? But that that's all addressing what this really is talking about. Shortest distance between a line and a point not on the line is the length of the line segment perpendicular to the line from the point. That's what I was talking about here. That's why I just said that super fast because I've already talked about it. Distance between two parallel lines is the distance between one of the lines and any point on the other line, and any corresponding point. I never made a, a sheet that I, I never met a sheet that I couldn't put a typo in. Uh, in a plane of two lines are equidistant from a third line and the two lines are parallel to one another, right? That, that was actually the reason why we were able to draw a third parallel line for this question up here. Right, because if, the, if there's another line that's equally distant from two other lines, then those would be parallel to each other, right? But if they're equally distant from a third line, then they're, they'd be parallel to each other. So basically what that's getting at, I'll just show, I'll just draw a quick diagram here. Let's say I have just one line that's kind of floating out in space. And I tell you that you're gonna go D units away, but in the downward direction. All right, so let me just get a little, little tiny little line segment here. I'll call it D but I'm gonna do that consistently, right? So this distance here would be D also. Then what you would have is a second line that's parallel to the first line. Right? 
All right? So these two lines will be parallel to one another. Now, if I tell you that you're also going to go, oh, why did I do that in green? I know that. But if I tell you that you're going to go D units, so the same number of units in the opposite direction, but maybe not even. Maybe you want to go um, F units. It, it doesn't really make a difference. Let's say I want to go F units here in this direction. So D in this direction, F in this direction. Then this new line on this side would be parallel to the original line. All right, so green is parallel to blue, red is parallel to blue, therefore green is parallel to red. In fact, all three are parallel to each other. All right, that's all that rule is really getting at. All right, but it also allows you, if you're given two lines that you know are parallel, you could also make a third line in between that are parallel to both. All right. And then the last one we've actually already addressed, kind of. So with that whole M and N thing uh, up here, we had a perpendicular transversal, all right? Now that transversal we call, we called L for some reason, all right? But let me call it T, just for clarity's sake, T for transversal. All right, and I'll give it a little subscript. I'll call that T1 for transversal number one. Now what I can do is I can create a second transversal, also perpendicular to M and N that I would call T2, judgment day. So then what that's telling me is that, or what this rule is telling me anyway, is that line T1 would be perpendicular, I'm oh, sorry, parallel to line T2. All right, because they're each of them are perpendicular to the same parallel line. And, and it really doesn't have to be two parallel lines, just one parallel line would get the job done. One parallel line, just one line would get the job done. But in this case, we have the added bonus of the fact that there are happen there happen to be two parallel lines, but that would give us a uh, a parallel relationship. But the reverse holds true, where if you have a transversal that's perpendicular to two lines, then those two lines are are parallel to one another. Right. So that was the original diagram that I had there. Right. So I just kind of kind of amped it up a little bit. Right. So the example below, determine which lines, if any, are parallel, explain how you know. Well, you look at the numerical values here. I got 103 and I got a 77 and I got a, a 100. All right. Now, if T and V, well, sorry, B and C, it's another one of those overly busy diagrams, but line B and line C, those are not going to be parallel to one another. B is not parallel to C. And that's because if they were going to be parallel, then these two angles would need to add to 180. Let me make that look a little bit better. All right. And that's because 77 degrees plus 100 degrees is equal to 177 degrees, which is not 180 degrees, all right? Those are consecutive interior angles. Consecutive interior angles have to add to 180 degrees if it's going to be a parallel line situation, all right? So, 
I'll actually write the whole statement out here. If two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then the consecutive interior angles are supplementary. Right. So if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal and the consecutive interior angles are supplementary, that's the rule. That's not what happened, right? So B cannot be parallel to C, right? Now, on the other hand, if we look at this cluster of angles, We can assume now, or deduce, if we want to get all logical about it, which we do, that this is 77 degrees. And that's because those are vertical angles. And vertical angles are always congruent to each other. Right? So now I have enough to say that A and B are, congru are, are parallel to one another. And that's because 103 plus 77 is equal to 180 degrees. Same rule. Two parallel lines are cut by a transversal of consecutive interior angles are congruent. Right? So that would be this pair of angles. Now, this is a way of just kind of getting at a relationship quick and dirty, but we didn't, this is not a, a deductive proof. You know, it, it, we didn't cross the T's and dot the I's and explain every single step from, from one to the next. It was just like, all right, how do you know that they're congruent? How do you know that they're parallel? Well, those are vertical angles. Those are consecutive interior angles, and that's how it all works, and blah, blah, blah. What we need to do is we need to get at the logic of it and make sure that we can articulate from premises to conclusions in a clear, organized fashion, right? So this will get the job done if it's like, are they congruent or not? Yes or no, what are the values? But if we want a rigorous deductive proof, then we would need more than this, right? So that's what we're working towards, which is where all the laws of logic come back into play. Well, maybe not all of them, but the most important ones. Okay. So this was that connection I was um, foreshadowing, I guess, for lack of a better term, um, in the last unit. And, and here we are. So using laws of logic, to draw conclusions, the process represent each statement symbolically, right? P's and Q's if you want, but usually letters that are consistent with whatever the scenario is, just something easy to remember. Refer to the laws of logic from the previous lesson to determine any valid conclusions, state each conclusion as well as appropriate justification. Uh, and I, I, I took the, uh, the table from the last unit the laws of logic, and I put it at the end of this package just so you have it, so you don't have to go bouncing back and forth, right? But um, one thing that I added in that I didn't realize wasn't there to begin with was uh, one of those item potent laws. So number eight, for some reason, I didn't have the and there. I had the or, but I didn't have the and. I don't know why. And so it didn't, it didn't matter in the last unit because it never came up, or at least not on any assessment. We talked about it, but it, it didn't really amount to much. But it's going to matter here, so it was worth getting into, or at least making mention of. Um, so, anywho, there we are. 
if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then the alternate interior angles are congruent. That's our first statement. Second statement, if the corresponding angles are not congruent, then the alternate interior angles are not congruent. The corresponding angles are not congruent. Right, so when you write it like that, that, that like boggles the mind. It's a, it's a little in, intense, but if we break it down based off of uh, symbolic notation and the laws of logic, it, it'll get a lot easier, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna create some simplified statements here because I, I, I don't like the looks of this. Two parallel lines are cut by a transversal. So I'm going to use P for parallel. Right. Parallel lines cut by a transversal. I mean, it's a whole statement, but you know, no, I'm using the P to represent parallel. Alternate interior angles are congruent. You know, it's it's premise conclusion. In fact. It's really everything after if followed by everything after then. You know, so this is a P for parallel, like I said. And then I, you know, I could use Q, we use Q a lot, but that doesn't make me think alternate interior angles are congruent. So I'm going to use a lowercase a. Right. So then this is an if then sentence. So P implies A. If the corresponding angles are not congruent, right? So now we're talking about corresponding angles rather than rather than uh, parallel lines. So it's just changing things up a little bit. So let's go with I'll use this. Actually, that was a little dark if I remember correctly. Let's go a little lighter. If the corresponding angles are not congruent, so we get a knot in there, and it's corresponding angles, so I'm going to go with a knot C. Then the alternate interior angles are not congruent, right? So still a reference to alternate interior angles, but this time they're not congruent. So that's a knot sentence. So not A. Then it just flat out says the corresponding angles are not congruent. Well, that, that's the same as the first premise. Uh, I'm sorry, the second premise. Okay, so this one is my P. These are both related to A in some capacity. But then we have an affirmation of the premise of the second sentence. That sounds an awful lot like affirm by affirming or modus ponens. So we have not C implies not A and not C. That gives us not A by modus ponens. All right, so that's an affirmation. So I can take that answer, if you will, or really conclusion, and merge that with the first conditional sentence, which was P implies A. And that would allow us to conclude or deduce not P by modus tollens. Right, that's the, denies by denying. That's, uh, I think it's the second to last in the last rules. I'm gonna pull it right. I'll, I'll come back to this page in a sec, but that's, uh, oh, the third to the last and, and the, the second to the last. Modus ponens and modus tollens. And so that's these, the, this pair of values, um, symbols, notations, et cetera. Could I ask a quick question? I, I understand the modus tollens one, why, we, why we're doing that. Well, how did we get the, the other one though, modus ponens? The modus ponens? 
Yeah, on, the, on this one, on this example. Yeah, so whenever the premise is affirmed, so we have a confirmation of the premise here, then the conclusion is confirmed. And that's that's what modus ponens tells us. Oh, okay. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, in the modus tollens is the one where you, you you're negating the conclusion, and so that implies that the, the premise is also negated. Right. But now that we have our symbolic notation here, and we have a sort of a key. Like it's not not the world's most elaborate key here, but I use a little color coding system. So, you know, it works for me, but if you need to write, let P equal two parallel lines or cut by a transversal, let A equal alt alternate interior angles are congruent, that's not the worst idea in the world, you know, but I, I like the color coding because it's easy for me to do with the app. But I now know that, well, I know two pieces of information. And again, the direction said, determine whether a valid conclusion can be reached from the set of statements. So I guess the answer is yes, they can. a, a valid conclusion can be drawn. I, I drew two of them, but it'd be nice to know what those two are, right? So not A is telling us that the alternate interior angles are not congruent. Right. So not A is telling us alternate interior angles are not congruent and not P. Well, that could that could go a couple of different ways. You know, because P is saying two parallel lines are cut by a transversal. So what is the P really telling us? That there are two parallel lines and it just wasn't cut by a transversal? Or those two lines weren't parallel to begin with, and they're still cut by a transversal. It could go either way. So what we'd have to say here is, it is not the, that's the weird language that we use. It is not the case that two parallel lines are cut by a transversal. I'll reduce the size in a second. All right, let's do the whole thing. Okay, so that, that gets out the idea that something about that premise is not true. We just don't know what part. You know, because it could be that they're not parallel. It could be that they are parallel, but not cut by a transversal. It could be that they're not parallel and also not cut by a transversal. Any of those possibilities are covered by this statement here. It is not the case that two parallel lines are cut by a transversal. All right. So it's like saying, it is not the case that I am wearing a red shirt and blue shorts. Okay. So does that mean that I'm wearing a red shirt but not the blue shorts that I'm wearing. Uh, just trying to make sure I remember what I just said. That I am wearing the blue shorts, but not the red shirt, or not wearing either of the blue shorts uh, or the red shirt. Yeah. So uh, any of those possibilities would be covered by. It is not the case that I'm wearing a red shirt and blue shorts. Yeah. So number two, laws of logic to determine whether a valid conclusion, blah, blah, blah. If two angles form a linear pair and are congruent, they are both right angles. Angle A and angle B are both right angles, right? So the first thing we wanna cover here is the assumption that angle A and angle B or the two angles that are referenced in the first premise, all right? So that's one thing that we would wanna have in our mind 
but we would also, it wouldn't be the worst idea in the world to stipulate that. So assume angle A and angle B are the two angles referenced in the first premise or in the, well, there's only one premise. All right. Because it could be that, you know, like two angles form a linear pair and congruent. They're both right angles. And then, you know, maybe we we're talking about angles C and D, but now they're bringing up A and B. You know, it could be a, an inconsistency there, but that's not the case. All right. So, and also I'm not, I'm not about trick questions like that. So it, it would be consistent. All right. So, they form a linear pair and are congruent. So there's, an, there's a conjunction in here. So there, this, is a, this is a two for one kind of deal. So the two angles form a linear pair and the two angles are congruent. The conclusion would be that the two angles are right angles. So I would actually rewrite this whole sentence or at least reconsider it or reframe it to say, if angle A and angle B form a linear pair, or pair, and angle A is congruent to angle B, then I'll put the then in the second line. Angle A and angle B are right angles. That's actually what that first sentence is really saying. It's just written in more everyday terms. Okay? If angle A and angle B form a linear pair and angle A is congruent to angle B, then angle A and angle B are right angles. Then they, then they affirm the conclusion A and B are both right angles, All right? So really we have two major components in the premise. I'll highlight those. Two angles form a linear pair, we'll call that L. They're congruent, call that C. They're both right angles. It's really, they are both right angles. They, sometimes they don't put the word then in there. That, that, that's the way it is. Uh, R for right angles. So I'd say L and C implies R. And then they just flat out say, angle A and angle B are both right angles, that would be R, all right? So this one would be inconclusive. Because it seems to be a sort of confusion between modus tollens and modus ponens. So it's neither modus ponens nor Modus tollens. Okay. In order for modus ponens to have worked, the premise would have need, needed to be affirmed. So the second statement should have been L and C. In order for modus tollens to be true or to apply, denies by denying, that should have been a not R but that's not the case either. Now, if you look through all the different possibilities in the laws of logic, you're not gonna find one that's gonna allow you to draw a conclusion from this. Um, I, so at the end, you said premise would have been not R for the modus tollens. What was for the modus premise? 
Yeah. What about the premise would have been affirmed for the uh, modus ponens? What would it have had to have been if it was? That would have had to have been L and C. It would have had to have affirmed the premise okay. of the original sentence. All right. Now, when you get at the logic of it, I mean, it's all, all getting at the logic, I guess. But the only instance, you know, if you think about all the different ways in which you can get true results from a conditional sentence versus the one way where you can get a false result, that would be true implies false. Right. So for a conditional sentence, the only way, and I'll let me just reduce here again. Only way for conditional to be false is true implies false. That's the only way, All right? So when, when you have a situation like this, you run into a little bit of a problem with the premise because when I affirm the conclusion, I'm saying that the R is true, right? So we're making a claim here that R is true, but they already told us that, right? They told us they were both right angles, right? So the logic of it gets tricky because if that's true, you think about the different ways that you can get a true result when the conclusion of a conditional is true, right? Something implies true. Well, that something could be true and still give us a true result. Something implies true, that something could be false and we would still get a true result, right? So this would be inconclusive because the premise can either be true or false. And that's what makes, well, that's what makes logic weird because everything about this seems to make it make perfect sense. Because if I tell you that two, if two angles form a linear pair, linear pair means those are two, two angles that form a straight line. You know, so for example, something like this. This would be a linear pair because these two angles would form a straight line that would give you 180 degrees, right? If I tell you that they form a linear pair and they're congruent, then what I'm doing is I'm taking what could be an angle that looks like this and I'm bending it so that it goes vertical because the only way they'd ever be congruent is if it, form two 90 degree angles. I know that's per not perfectly 90 degrees. Let's see if I can. Well, that's definitely not 90 degrees. That's 90 degrees. So that's the only way it could look if they form a linear pair and they're congruent, meaning they're equal in measure, then they both have to be 90 degrees. Then they're both right angles. Now, if I tell you that angle A and angle B are right angles, then you would think, okay, well, they must be a linear pair, right? But it's the and part of it that messes everything up, right? Because you could have, you know, we know that they could be congruent or they must be congruent because they're both 90 degrees, but just because two angles are congruent does not necessarily mean they form a, a linear pair. So for example, but it seems like you say that they form a linear pair, don't you? Well, that that's the conditional part of it. I'm saying if they form a linear pair and they're congruent, then they're right angles. That's okay. definite. Okay. But here's an instance where you have two right angles, but those don't form a linear pair. That's the thing. That, that's where we run into a problem with the logic, right? 
this is a linear pair. These two, yeah, they're both 90 degree angles. They're both right angles. They're both congruent to one another. They don't form a linear pair though. Yeah. So that's where the logic kind of helps us out because when you read or you read a statement like that, it seems to make perfect sense. Like everything is going to work out just fine, but then you run into trouble and you're like, oh, I thought it would be, I thought it would make sense. And here we are, you know. Um, so number three is kind of a little bit beyond what we've gotten to so far, but I, I tried to keep it purposely vague. So the figure is not a square or it is a rectangle. So not a square or it's a rectangle. So this is a disjunction. So I'll use S for square or for rectangle. It says not. So not S or R. All right. Then it says the figure is not a rectangle. So back to the R. And it's a quadrilateral. All right. So that's a new one. Quadrilateral. So we have the R here and a Q for quadrilateral. All right. Now this one's a conjunction. So not R. They have a little knot here. And Q. All right. Now this one, well, it's weird in a bunch of different levels, but there's a lot we can do with this. It just doesn't seem like there's anything we can do with it. That first sentence here, that's the key to everything. That's the implication identity. Let me use a different color there. I'm kind of beating these colors to death here. So not S or R, all right? So let's go down to our table here at the end. I mean, it's also in the last packet too, but if we go to the implication identity of very last one, there's a relationship between conditionals and disjunctions. So not P or Q is the same as P then Q. All right, these two are interchangeable. Remember, the double-sided arrow means they're interchangeable, they're equivalent, logically, All right? So P implies Q, not P or Q mean the same thing, All right? So that tells me that, again, it was originally in the, in the implication identity, it's not P or Q, that's the same as S implies R, all right? That's the implication identity. And I'll just jot it down here again. So not P or Q is logically equivalent to P implies Q. All right. So now I've taken a disjunction and made it conditional. So the sentence, the figure is not a square or it's a rectangle is the same as saying, if the figure, if the figure is a square, then it is a rectangle, All right? So we keep that in mind. Now, the second one, that was, that's kind of an important one to talk about because that was the one that I forgot to put in the packet last unit. That's the idempotent identity or law. All right. So what this means is that not R and not and Q are both true. All right. So I'll just bring it bring it back here. The idempotent that's number eight laws. All right. Now well, there's actually two other variations of the item potent laws that I don't even have here. All right, so hold on. Let me let me elaborate on this a little bit. If you have P and Q, then P is true. If you have P and Q, 
then Q is true. Or Q is true specifically. Not, it's not necessarily conditional. It's equivalent to either of those cases being true. All right. Because in order for an and sentence to be true, both parts have to be true. All right. So it's really the same as saying if P is true, if, if P and Q is true, then P is true and Q is true. It's looking at it as two separate um, entities. All right. Um, there, there's, there's a case to be made that, you know, you could kind of consider it through the lens of the domination laws too, but I think it's easier if you look at it from the item potent laws. But right. how, so, how come they don't have like the, we're going to be looking at not, not things. How come there isn't an example there of a not? Oh, well, so just because we could have so many different examples that we got to cut it off somewhere, but okay, I could throw no, but it's good for me to know. So basically with the laws of logic, you can always put in a not sign. If you put in a not sign for both of them, that would be accurate as well, right? Like for Correct. that. Oh, good to know. Okay. So not P and not P and then going to. Would it be then to P or to not P there? Would everything have a not? Oh, I see you're writing it, okay. So the not P or it, it could also be not Q. And I guess for the one that I wrote previously, we could also say not P and Q would be equivalent to just a Q because basically any part of the and sentence would be true. So in this case, I'm just taking this piece. In this case, I'm just taking this piece and so on. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so all that's saying is, yeah, that's, that's, I'm glad you brought that up because it, it, it's confusing, uh, especially since, you know, Typically, we only write the one example, one for the conjunction, one for the, the disjunction, but there's so many different ways to look at it. And that's where logic gets confusing because whenever you have a, a conjunction, so an and, each part of that conjunction is going to be true in order for the whole sentence to be true. Right? So, and, you know, just going back to the example I keep using over and over again, I am wearing a red shirt and blue shorts. If I tell you that that whole sentence is true, then I'm then it must be true that I'm wearing the red shirt. It must be true that I'm wearing the blue shorts, right? So that brings us to this conjunction. Oops, sorry. So we can conclude that not R is true. We could also conclude that S is true. And that's the item potent laws, right? Both of those would now be true. So it's just a question of, you know, what, what are you going to find value? You know, like what's going to be more useful? I'm um, sorry, why did I write S? Nobody knows. Q is what I meant to write. So, if I look at these two pieces of information, let me get a different color. These two, now I have some modus tollens going on. S implies R, and I have my not R. My conclusion here would be not S by modus tollens. All right, so since not S, well, since S represents the figure as a square, not S would be that the figure is not a square. All right, so we we're able to draw that conclusion. All right, we're also able to draw that the conclusion of Q. Now I have nothing to pair Q with. So Q is its own conclusion in and of itself. All right, so it's kind of like a, uh, a separate conclusion, but equally important one. I'm gonna move some stuff over here. 
Q is telling us. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so um, when you when we have saying now that we're denying, we, we've we've denied by Lotus Tolens, what part of that question is denied? Like, are, does that mean we're, what part are we accepting and what part are we denying? Just that it's it, the whole thing. Does that yeah, mean so whatever the conclusion that, is? Yeah. You have the premise conclusion relationship, the if the then. Yeah. We're denying the conclusion, which in turn denies the premise. Okay. And I'm trying to look at the question for three. The figures is not a square or it is a rectangle. The figure is not a rectangle and it is a quadrilateral. So which part are we denying? Oh, so we're actually denying, because that, that was the thing where we got from this sentence here, which is the figure is not a square or it's a rectangle. That's this. Yes. By the implication identity, we were able to translate that into S implies R. Yes. So that's the thing that we're trying to deny or not deny, depending on how things work out. Okay. The implication identity gets us from here to here. Yes. But the but item potent. Yeah. Go sorry. ahead. Sorry, go ahead. That's all right. So the item potent laws get us from the not R and Q to mm -hmm. a not R and a Q separately. Okay. So then when we look at this pair here mm -hmm. as a separate example off on the side, mm -hmm. then we would say, okay, well, what conclusion can we draw from that? Mm -hmm. So we look at the relationship and we see that the conclusion is being denied. Okay. Because the conclusion in that conditional sentence is denied, the premise is also denied by modus tollens. So it's, it's actually the progression of looking at the different symbols after we've converted from the everyday language to symbolic form using the logical laws that's that's how it just evolved into a denies by denying situation okay it's not that we were looking for that it's just that's how it evolved okay but the premise is which part of can i i see what you're saying but can we go back and like uh is the is, which part of that those two sentences is the premise the premise all the so the premise is always the symbol before the arrow. So that's the if part of an if then sentence. So once we use the implication identity to get from not s imply uh, sorry not s or r to s implies r, then what we did was we changed the we we changed the phrasing of the problem. Instead of it being the figure is not a square or a rectangle. Mm -hmm. This now is thought of as by the implication identity. If the figure is a square, then it is a rectangle. Mm. So then the if the figure is a square part of it, that became the new premise. Mm. And that's the thing that we just refuted based off of the modus tollens. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so it, it's weird, but once you get the idea to, um, convert the language over and really start thinking about it in terms of, okay, this is what the problem says. This is what I want it to say based off of the, the laws of logic. Then it, then it starts to kind of make a little bit more sense. All right. But the Q, we, we were able to not really conclude too much from this, but we, we can say Q is true, right? That was one of the item potent laws. So in everyday language, Q represented the figure as a quadrilateral. Mm 
Okay, and not S was another conclusion that we were able to make. The figure is not a square. Right, so that's by the logic of it. But that's also relying on these original sentences being true, right? But if I'm trying to you know, just kind of tease out what kind of geometric figure I'm looking at, you know, maybe, you know, I don't want to make it like a guessing game or a puzzle or anything like that, but maybe it's something that you're looking to draw a conclusion about for whatever reason, you know, maybe a trivial reason, but maybe something really important. I now know that it is a quadrilateral, so it is a four-sided figure, but it's not a square. So it could be a rectangle, it could be a parallelogram, whatever that is. We'll talk about that next lesson okay. uh, or next. Sorry. And so but it could be a lot of yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So, so your last two sentences is kind of how we would end it off, like with with everything we've proved proven. We would we would be able to say that we know that these things are true. The figure is a quadrilateral, and the figure is not a square. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Right, and so the last one we'll do, I know we didn't take a second break, but um, this, is, this is the last one we're gonna do for tonight. And then I'm gonna uh, set you up with the assignment and then that'll be it. Um, the, I'm gonna do a second word of the day now. And so words of the day. And so that is going to be square, square, as in the four-sided geometric figure that we've been talking about, square, right? So uh, for number four, C is the midpoint of AB, then AC is congruent to BC. You see the progression here that we started off very generally. I'm sorry, we started off very generally and we're getting more specific, more specific. Now we're getting really specific, all right? And then in the next unit, oh, sorry, next part of the lesson, we'll get very, very specific, all right? But this is, building us up to that way of thinking, right? C is the midpoint, if C is the midpoint of AB, so this whole thing is a premise, then AC is congruent to BC, all right? So you can call it whatever you want. I tend to stay away from, I mean, you've seen what I've been doing here. I tend to stay away from the P's and Q's because it's kind of hard to tie that together with what it is you're, you're, you're trying to evaluate. All right, C is the midpoint. So I guess M for midpoint. All right, and then AC is congruent to BC. So maybe uh, C for congruent, All right? Uh, I'm gonna just kind of write that to the side of it, All right? Now it says AC is not congruent to BC. So that's talking about the, the same two sides but with a not, right? So that's the same, same relation, right? But actually, before we even get to that, let's just put the first sentence in symbolic form, if M, then C. So M implies C, all right? So then the second sentence, AC is not congruent to BC, right? So that's not C or not what I'm using C to represent, uh, or the triangles are congruent. Well, we use C to represent those two sides are congruent. Now we're getting into triangles be con uh, being congruent. That sounds like a different idea. So I'm gonna come up with a new symbol to represent that. Uh, T for triangles. But then they say C is the midpoint of AB. That's an affirmation of our initial premise, which we called M. So I can actually take these two, say, uh, say, uh, I can't speak anymore. That's, that's why we're gonna end soon. Uh, statements, sentences, and combine them, evaluate them against each other. M implies C and M, I'm affirming, this is an affirmation of my premise. 
M implies E, if M then C. If I am wearing a red shirt, then I'm wearing blue shorts. Hey, guess what? I'm wearing a red shirt. Hey, reasonable to assume that I'm going to be wear or deduce that I'm going to be wearing blue shorts. All right. So this is modus ponens. Right. Now that not C or T, yeah, it's it's one of those things like you don't realize you can do this until you do it a couple of times, and then you realize, oh, I can do that a lot. The the not C or T, that's the implication identity. Not C or T is the same as C implies T by the implication identity. These two things are equivalent to one another, all right? That's pretty much what we just did up here. It wasn't the easiest thing in the world to understand, but the more you think about it, the more it should make sense. If I'm telling you not C or T, which was that second sentence, a, C is not congruent to B, C, or the triangles are congruent, All right? That was what that second sentence read as. Now, I'm telling you that that means the same thing as if, so C is talking about A, C being congruent to B, C, then, T, the triangles are congruent. All right, that's what that, this new sentence reads as. That's logically equivalent to the original one. AC is not congruent to BC or the triangles are congruent. It means the same thing, All right? But the benefit of writing it this way is that I have this piece of information now, C implies T, that I could use in conjunction with the C here and using modus ponens, draw a conclusion and that would be T, again, by modus ponens, and now I know some things. I mean, I know that AC is congruent to BC, right? That's what this one means. I also know T is true, the triangles are congruent. all by the logic of the situation. I mean, it's easier said than done. But these two relationships here, the modus ponens occurring twice with a little implication identity along the way really gets the job done and allows us to draw these two meaningful conclusions. All right, so you have three sentences here uh, you know, like the, the valuable information was buried in there somewhere. Just a question of, you know, kind of pulling out or uh, eliciting the, the, the meaningful stuff. And you look at it and say, okay, well, what does this really mean? Give it to me simply. Well, what it means is AC and BC are congruent and the two triangles are congruent. So I'm assuming there are two triangles, but the, the triangles are congruent. Right now, this is out of context. I didn't give you a diagram. I didn't give you anything to look at and evaluate in a meaningful way. But that, if I did, we would know how to do that. So uh, that's that's what's coming ahead. Coming ahead. Coming, coming next. Uh, so what I'm going to ask you to do, aside from the actual assignment, is to just I mean, you don't have to memorize this, but familiarize yourself with this stuff because it, it'll, it'll be helpful. Um, a lot of it we've already talked about. And um, 
a lot of it is already familiar to you, but having a good, you know, you know, site recognition of, of, of these terms, it, it goes a long way, right? Because then we're gonna, we're gonna get into sort of simpler ways of proving things logically without always having to uh, refer back to the laws of logic, but we'll always have the laws of logic to work with if we need it, right? But, you know, that, that's a different story for a different time. So let me talk to you about the assignment. 